So we're, we're going to start this panel. Um, um, so I'm Cedric Georgi. I'm the co-founder of Cooking uh, Marketplace to connect host and guests around home cooked meals. And um, whoa, no light anymore. Um, yep. Um, so I, I, we, we have a very interesting panel today because um, when, when you're building a marketplace, when you're building a startup, um, at the end of the day, what really matters is um, the community you've created and if you reached or not a critical mass. Whatever the product, whatever the concept, um, at the end, if you build a community and if you have enough people using it, uh, it will be fine. If not, well, then you've tried and that's it. So we have four very interesting panelists with me today um, with very interesting experience about these two topics we'll cover in the next 50 minutes. So how to build and do you need to build a community around your peer-to-peer -peer marketplace and how to reach critical mass and we'll try to define uh, this critical mass and how you reach it. So um, in, in, in two, minutes, it, it, two minutes each of you, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and explain if needed um, your product and perhaps your current status and history. Um, we'll start with, uh, yeah, on the top right, so Meryl uh, from Hello. Vidressing, so Meryl. Hi, so Meryl Job, I'm co-founder and CEO of Vidressing.com. Vidressing is a marketplace specialized in fashion, peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, so uh, we're, we do mainly second-hand products. Um, the site was launched in December 2009, and since then it's been growing quite well. Um, especially over the last year, we grew five-fold. Um, we have currently around two million visits per month and over 400,000 products online. So it's pretty well, going well. And uh, we recently cl closed our Series A round of funding with uh, DN Capital, Python, and Early Bird for 4.6 million euros. Congrats. One, one, one question for you um, on, on vid dressing. So what are the markets you're active in? So France mainly? So yeah, today um, the site is, is mainly in France. It's uh, where 95% of our business is, is in France. Um, in, the site has only really been in French up until early March when we started communicating on our fundraising and then we translated the site in English. Uh, but the idea is uh, definitely to reinforce our position in France, but also to develop internationally, and we're currently looking at uh, different markets abroad. All right. Clément. Hi, everyone. Bonjour. So my name is uh, Clément Marcelet. I'm, uh, so I work for Airbnb, and I'm the head of community for France. So um, Airbnb is a trusted community marketplace, marketplace uh, for people to uh, list, discover, and book unique places around the world. We connect uh, uh, hosts and guests who want to, to, to experience uh, authentic uh, stays in the 192 countries around the world. Some numbers about the French market, perhaps? So, some numbers about the French market. So, we have uh, right now uh, um, 40,000 uh, listings in, in France. We opened the, uh, the French office in February 2012. And um, yeah, so Airbnb has been founded in 2008. And one interesting number is that uh, um, the founders, uh, it took a year for the founders in 2008 to get 100 users. So you can see how long it takes to, to, to get your first community. And, uh, and compared to, to, the, to the size of the community now, you can see the, the progression. But at the beginning, it's, it's always a little bit slow. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Katie? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Katie Neitz. And I am the community manager. Well, OK. I'm the community manager for a company called Gidzi, which was a place where anybody could um, organize and book things to do all over the world. So this is ranging from different classes and workshops and walking tours. Um, for example, there's a guy who um, has his own plane. And he would like to take people on sightseeing flights around Berlin. I taught a class about making goat cheese. You can learn how to make your own sock monkey or take a really cool walking tour around Berlin or anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, we had activities happening in over 140 cities in 40 different countries. And last week on Wednesday, we announced that Gidzi is actually merging with another great Berlin company called Get Your Guide. And together, we have formed the world's largest online platform for booking tours and activities. Um, and we just reached 20,000 activities around the world. 
So during, oh, just before, during this panel, we'll, um, well, you will talk a lot about the experience you had at Gitsi, uh, but just in a few, in a few words, what, what will change because of this, or thanks to this acquisition or because of the acquisition? Um, how will Gitsi evolve? Yeah, okay, so um, our goal has always been to, to bring people together around activities. Um, we really firmly believe that the best things in life are not things, they're experiences, and that's sort of the idea that we run with. Um, and so um, the Gidzi team has all joined the Get Your Guide team, and uh, we're going to help them in three areas. It's in design, um, to help make their website really great, social, um, which is to help bring uh, people together, um, I guess, online and connect around the brand, and mobile, to help people uh, book things on the go. All right, thank you. Juho? Yeah, hi. So my name is Juho Makkonen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of ShareTribe. ShareTribe uh, is... Sorry to... Yeah, a little bit like that. ShareTribe uh, is a platform for creating your own peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. So basically it could be uh, just an online flea market for a university campus, or it could be a tool lending platform for a neighborhood. But it could be even used by a startup which has a collaborative consumption idea and wants to create a quick MVP and test their product out and get started from right away. So uh, we're st still a pretty young company. We started a year and a half ago. Uh, we currently have a bit more than 700 of these marketplaces started all over the world. Uh, most of these are still fairly young, so they're small communities. Uh, they might be university campuses, neighborhoods. The biggest one is the University Campus in Finland, which has around 5,000 people. So that's ShareTribe. Okay. Okay. We'll 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 start with with the first um, with the first part of this panel, and um, we'll we'll talk in the next 20 minutes about communities. Um, we we cannot start the panel about communities without defining a community uh, because if if it's possible. Um, so yeah. Who wants to answer this stupid and basic question? What's a community? Clément, you wanna you wanna try? Well, so this is our definition and how we consider uh, the community. Basically, for us, a community is just a group of individuals. That's that's very simple, but it's just a way to to remind that. Every person is different. Uh, every users we have, uh, they have different uh, questions and backgrounds. So, uh, so we always uh, to 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 always keep in mind that a community is basically a group of individuals. Yeah, I, I, I would, would oh go ahead. Yeah, I would pass add that uh, it's a group of individuals, and those individuals identify themselves as member of that group. Then, and usually that's community. I I would add to that and think uh, by saying that. Community for me is yes a group of individuals and who identify with a particular community, but also who share, you know, perhaps some interests, and and th those are the shared interests or mutual interests that bring them together. I agree with all of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so when okay, so if if I take your definition, um, so it's a group of people that feel they are part of this group. Um, so when you're part, not part of this group or when you're trying to create or organize a community, how do you know uh, if or when you have a community? So is there like a tipping point? Um, so at what stage do you, can, you, can you see that you, you had a group of people and this group of people is turning into a community? Maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe when they start having conversations with each other or uh, express their gratitude for being a part of the community that you've created. I think using the word community is also really important in, um, in how you approach these people in the first place so they feel like they are a part of it and then when they start to sort of talk about being a part of it, that's how you know that you have one, maybe. I would say like community is, is, is fairly intrinsic to platforms that are you know UGC, user-generated content-based platforms. And, and which is true of almost any you know, marketplace because the supply and the demand is both being generated by you know, the people who use your platform, so hence the community. And once you start getting traction, once you start getting a membership base, I mean, it can be, everything is relative. So you know, along the various stages of growth, 10 to 100, 2,000, 10,000, et cetera, um, once you start getting these people coming to use your platform um, and you know, buying, selling together, or you know, interacting amongst each other because they're really the ones generating every, every, all the activity that's happening on your site. I guess I would say, you know, any point along those lines, you, you start developing that community. And if you're talking about the marketplace, then I think that uh, if you see that it's not just about transactions, but people are just 
talking with each other about random things, even maybe organizing meetups and meeting, meeting them each other in real life, then you know that you, you have not only have a marketplace, but you also have a community. Yeah. So, but, okay, so you not only have a marketplace, you have a community, but why do you need a community? Uh, I mean, as a marketplace, and we'll talk about it, you need some supply, you need some demand. So why do you need to spend time on building a community? Well, uh, at least one thing probably is that this, this thing is all about kind of viral mouth-to-mouth -mouth spread and usually those people who feel that this is something, this particular marketplace is something that I want to tell my friends about, those are the funds who are most identified with that community. So, so you need those people. Those might, it might be even 1% or 10% of, of all the users, but those are the ones who are actually getting you, getting you more tracks and so also from business perspective, it's really crucial that they feel being a part of a community. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's also uh, very important to, uh, to, to, to meet your community uh, at the er early stage because it, in a way it validates your model and, and it's a great way to get a lot of feedback um, about your product, your service and their expectations. And, and, and I think that it's very central. It, it can be very central in your strategy. It can be a way to recruit uh, people in your team. Sometimes from your community, you have the best employees at the end. Uh, are you speaking about yourself? Or? I'm actually speaking about myself, yeah, yeah too. <laughs> okay, for, <laughs> for Zuzo, uh, I mean, for, for the people that are not familiar with Clement's story, uh, just can yeah. you explain in one sentence? Yeah, okay, so I was one of the first users of um, Airbnb uh, in Paris. I was actually the, the 46th uh, host uh, in Paris in 2009. And um, so uh, in 2009, Program, uh, who was the mentor, mentor of the, the founders at the, the Y Combinator in, in San Francisco, they, he gave uh, them this great advice, uh, which was to, to, to take a, a plane ticket and to meet their community. So they started uh, in, at uh, New York, sorry, and, and then Paris. So uh, they organized this meetup. We had 150 hosts. So right now we have something like 15,000. So you can see the, the difference. And this is how I met them. And I do remember that uh, during this uh, little cafe that I had with, uh, with Brian Chesky, he, he had his, this, his laptop and he opened it and uh, he asked me, okay, so Clement, this is the, the new version of the website we're working on. What do you think about it? What should we do? And, and I was so surprised of this approach and I, I really loved it. And, um, and, and yeah, so uh, in, in, 2000, uh, in November 2011, I, I joined the company when it was time to open the office in France. Okay. Um, I think in the case of VDressing, community really defined our brand positioning and even our reason to exist as a platform. Um, because before VDressing, which was um, you know back in end of 2008, when I was I was I actually had the idea to launch VDressing because I was looking for a way to sell some of my own clothing and fashion accessories. Being a fan of fashion and um, having you know bought too many things and not enough room in my uh, wardrobe. I was looking for a way to sell some of these things, and at the time there were only these large generalist marketplaces that were selling everything from books to computers to toys to just everything, and I didn't feel fashion really had its place in that, so it wasn't really being um, you know, highlighted enough, valued enough as a product category, but also just the people who love fashion were being somewhat drowned amongst all different sorts of people on these platforms. And I think uh, one of the things that really motivated me, inspired me to launch Vitrosing was um, as, as a fashion lover, I was reading a lot of fashion blogs and I noticed that all these fashion bloggers were launching their own V-dressing blogs, which in V-dressing in France, in French means to empty your own, empty your wardrobe. So what they were doing were they were selling directly to their readers and, and what was great about that is that they had that community spirit, that sense of shared interest, that sense of, you know, different fashion, fashion lovers coming together on their own blogs that they weren't having on eBay and so that they felt they could trust more the people who were you know, buying directly from their blogs. And so that was really inspiring. And I, I was really inspired by that to create a community platform where it, the idea would re really be to attract people who love fashion, so people with the shared interests, and, and for them to, you know, be able to buy and sell amongst a community of, of fashion lovers. So. so you didn't create a community, you, you tried to attract an existing one. Exactly. So I mean, fashion lovers have ex been existent since forever, but I guess, I mean, it was... The demand was there. It's the solution um, wasn't wasn't optimal. So that's really what you know inspired when, me. 
Okay, when, when you, you're all building marketplaces, so like one specific thing about marketplaces, you need a supply, you need a demand. Um, and so you have usually three types of people, the one doing one thing, the one doing the other thing, and the one doing both things. So do you have one community or several, like three at the maximum? So how do you manage these things that you can have different kind of communities, host and guest, for example, for Airbnb? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting point because it, it's clear that the, the guests and, uh, and the host, they don't have the same um, questions. For instance, for a host creating his profile and his listing on, on Airbnb is really engaging because at the end he's going to welcome unknown people as, at his place. So he may have, or he or she may have a lot of irrational questions or very rational specific questions and and uh, we 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 don't actually we spend more time on um, sensitivation and also education with our hosts which is something we don't really do uh, with our guests because at the end our hosts they are the one who provides the the, the experience and um, if we want to to increase this great word uh, word of mouth that we have now we really have to make sure that our hosts have the, the, the good product, have the good service, the good advices, and it's, it's, uh, it's really important for us to have these uh, very close um, um, connections. This is why we, we meet them uh, in the real life. We organize a lot of meetups offline. I think we're, we're gonna talk about that uh, later. And um, because, uh, because trust is really fundamental and, and, and they need to be reassured that yes, there is a team, a dedicated team for, for them in, in France, in Paris. So, um, but, but at the end, it's, we also noticed that it was really important to, to, to create connections between them. For instance, a Parisian uh, guest so, who uses Airbnb to travel uh, abroad, uh, it can be really interesting for him to meet a host because sometimes he doesn't even know the, the, the host side uh, of the site and he may have a lot of questions and, and, and by meeting a, a host in the real life can be a not so great way to, for him to, to become a host as well. Yeah, we have uh, almost the exact same answer for Gidzi. Uh, um, yeah, we, we put a lot of time and effort into uh, educating our organizers uh, to make sure that they have a trusted profile, giving them resources to help them be found in our search results, help them get more customers, um, and then same with, yeah, with the, uh, the bookers, sorry. We wanted to um, sort of show them the other side of the story, so hopefully one day they could share one of the things that they loved. Um, on Gidzi yeah. as well. And regarding the, the values, I think we, we, it's still the same community because maybe the, 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 um, the overlap we have between guest and host is that um, these are people who are, I think, a little bit open-minded because at the end you have people who are open to, to welcome unknown people and on the other hand you have people who are ready to, 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 to travel with people they don't really know. So, uh, so I think maybe that's the, the, the common point uh, between, uh, between our guest and our host. And yeah, after that, it's so different. That. And I think with any marketplace, you always want to you know, convert you know, people who are on the supply side to the demand side and, and vice versa. I mean, that's really how you um, grow the market from the strongest is, you know, by having these people who do both. I mean, they're going to be the biggest ambassadors and uh, of your brand, and they're the ones who are going to be really talking about your brand the most outside of, you know, in, in their social circles. And, and that's why community is so fundamental to any marketplace, uh, peer to peer marketplace, because um, it, it, it's really what grows that uh, network effect, especially like in a model such as V-Dressing, where we take a 10% commission we can't invest like you know some other traditional B2C uh, e-commerce platforms in uh, the traditional customer acquisition channels. So you know our growth has been and is still continues to still be driven so much by um, you know word of mouth, uh, by buzz, um, by you know bloggers talking about it, by um, you know press, and and just really just by this general network effect that is generated by you know users who members of the community who love your product and who come back to it and who recommend it. So let's, let's go to the, to the question where we want to understand how you engage and I don't like this, work, ma this word manage, but let's use it like community manager, but how you, you engage and manage your, your communities. Um, so, on, on, so both of you, uh, like two of you are community managers or head of community. Uh, so like really briefly, what is your main objective 
uh, and KPIs as, as, as an employee? Yeah, the KPI thing um, sort of stresses me out a lot. <laughs> so KPI is key performance indicator, so it's how you've been uh, measured, and yeah. how you prove your work has done something yeah. at the end um, of the day. <laughs> so, I mean, it depends on, I think, setting KPIs is a really tricky thing, especially for community managers, for me specifically, because a lot of it's like not so measurable, it's just sort of like vibes, you know, like are people stoked? Yeah, so you're doing a good job. Um, and I, I also think it was really important for, to set KPIs depending on the work that I was doing. So for me, like about 70 or 80% of my time is spent doing customer support. So I guess setting KPIs in that area would be something that's really uh, easy to do. Um, I guess, yeah, the satisfaction, how long it takes to answer a question, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, we also engaged people on other ways, obviously like social channels, uh, but this is just another uh, channel for communication for us. So this is also sort of under customer support um, and direct feedback and stuff. And also to help build a brand identity on the places where people are talking about people. And then we have a blog. And then also just inherent within the platform is, is other ways that we engage people. So giving them opportunities to talk to each other and also to talk to us. Yeah. It's, it's nearly the same approach, really. Um, so um, at the Paris office, we have someone in charge of uh, all the social networks, basically Facebook and Twitter. We don't use uh, many others. But uh, our main job uh, is to, uh, to create those meetups. So um, during yeah. a year, uh, we organize more than 100 meetups in, in France, so Paris, uh, but also uh, uh, like 20, 20 cities uh, in France. and. Um, it's, it's really important for us uh, to, to remind them, to remind our hosts and guests that uh, we have this local approach and we, we have a team dedica a dedicated team for, for, for them. So uh, we basically do offline community management. So it's really hard, at, uh, mostly offline, to, to track your performances. Uh, I think that when, you, when we see that 60% uh, of our growth comes from the word of mouth, well, I think maybe we are doing a pretty good job. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and, and um, it's, it's really hard to, to, to measure how many people will uh, talk about the, the, this meetup around them to their friends before, after. So yeah, we can track how, how many friends they, they brought to during the meetup, but still, it's just, uh, I don't think it's a very precise KPI. Yeah. And, and, we, we do it because we, we know that our community wants us to, to, to do it. So, in fact, it's more like in reaction, uh, reactive rather than proactive. But um, it's, it's something we actually do believe in it. And it's really important to, for this kind of uh, operations just to be sure that it's a part of your strategy and you believe in it even if you don't have all the KPIs, because yeah. otherwise, yeah, sometimes you could do, uh, you could think, okay, we are gonna do only uh, online marketing because it's great, we can track everything. <laughs> but yeah, you have to believe in it. Quick question, so you said 60% is coming from word of mouth. We'll talk about uh, critical mass later and user acquisition. So where, what are the 40 remaining percentage? Can you just do a split? Uh, well, I think that um, the the press coverage is uh, is uh, is uh, is also a, a big part of it. We also do, yeah, uh, online uh, online marketing, so uh, Google and and Facebook for sure, which is fundamental. But uh, yeah, the, the having um, having someone who can talk to the press and everything, and it has been very something important for for us. Uh, it's a great way to talk about, to have testimonials from our host and guests and, and when, when, um, when someone hears uh, about us through uh, a host or a guest who testifies his experience, that's the most valuable um, uh, promotion we can have. Okay. Juho, you have um, a slightly different model because you allow your members to create their own um, tribes, communities. Do you provide them um, with tools to engage with the local communities? Do you give them tools or advice on how to engage with our community? Yeah, we kind of, because we also started by building the first communities ourselves in some universities and neighborhoods. So we are kind of tried to 
collect some lessons learned and the best practices. So the idea, it's still a bit, a bit work in progress, but we are trying to build this toolkit which, which consists both from software tools, but then also from just like guides and, and what works in which type of community. Obviously, it also depends a lot on the type of the community and type of the marketplace. It's just like local sharing for free group, or is it like a startup trying to build with some global ambitions? So, okay. um, on, on on the offline side, so you know, Clement, you you talked about it, but um, um, maybe we'll, do you do offline meetups for your community where you can have like offline vid dressing, for example? What do that, you do? That's an interesting question. We did that um, in the beginning, just to give you a little background about vid dressing. So we, we've done very little paid marketing. We started in March 2012. So most of our growth has definitely been organic. And um, today, around 80% of our traffic is free. So it's um, SEO or um, you know, direct word of mouth. Uh, press um, contributed to that as well. Um, so, I think one of the tricky things about, um, you know, doing offline events, which are so important and actually it's really something we want to do more and more of, is, is measuring what is the impact. So, um, you can't, I mean, it's not, it's not something that can be totally measured, you know, it's not whatever, like, SEM campaigns, but um, I think you can look at the impact on your direct traffic, on, you know, just the, the amount of new t followers you have, new uh, fans you have, I mean, you can see if that has an impact, but also just in terms of, um, I think it's very important for any community, especially such as an Airbnb or V dressing, to meet your clients, to understand them better, to get to know them, and um, there's all, you know, there's a lot of qualitative impact you can you can have with these kinds of events. So that is definitely something um, we've done a bit in the past, but we really want to do more of in 2013. Yeah, if if I may, there is also an, uh, a great thing um, in doing those meetups that you you always have this kind of wow effect uh, because uh, we, we still, for a lot of people, it's still uh, unbelievable to, to meet a website. Yeah. And this is something we often hear during the meetups is that, wow, this is really cool. I mean, you, you took a train to, to, meet up, we, 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 to meet us. We were in Corsica, for instance, uh, last month, and they were so surprised. And, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a way to remind them that, uh, no, we, we actually don't have engineers in, in France. And a website is not only engineers and a server, you have also uh, customer support, you have all those services, and, and, and for your users just to, to show them that it's, yeah, it's possible to meet a website, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, you humanize really the, the, yeah. your brand, your site, and uh, it's really important for a lot of people where we spend so much time online, but I think the conversions of online and offline is, is, is becoming really important, and I think we'll see more and more of that. You wanted to add something or no? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we did a bunch of meetups with kids. It's really important to us as well. I, the whole point is to meet people offline, right? And like connect in real life. So that was sort of what we tried to do. We did the monthly. They were awesome. It's nice uh, to meet people you talk to on the internet in real life. Yeah, and I think that we, we both have the same uh, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> problematic, which is to create connections between hosts yeah. because you can have like a, a self-education uh, between the, the, the users yeah. themselves and, and it's great for them when, when someone comes to the meetup and, we, and who is interesting by renting his place, he can answer, answer his questions to the team, which is good, but also that's the opportunity for him to, to meet experienced hosts who can share their, their tips and, and it's, it's very valuable. Yeah, and collaborate sometimes too, yeah. which is also super exciting to yeah. see. And yeah, um, no, I, I won't add anything on this. Um, what about the content? Um, is because, generally speaking, not only on, on, on the sharing economy or, or even peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, you will hear a lot of people explaining that when you want to create or engage a community, you need to create some content, um, like magazine, picture, anything, but content is key. What, what's your position on this? Do you create content to, to feed your community? We created a lot of uh, super valuable content, at least we thought, like the educational resources, for example, was really, really important for us. And then, I mean, in terms of social sharing, um, trying to create value for people that are looking for, I guess, inspiration or whatever on our page and trying to be really active in like engaging, um, yeah, Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or whatever. Um, platform, share, uh, words I don't know. Um, yeah, so we, we shared a lot and we tried to make it as valuable as possible. Pictures, guys, if you're looking for things that people want to consume, pictures of really nice like landscapes with an inspirational quote on them, you got yourselves a winner. Yeah, people love quotes. They love them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I think um, view dressing, I mean, it's, it's really our users, first of all, are the members of our community who are generating the transactional content. I mean, all the products are uploaded by mainly individual users. We have very few professional sellers. Um, so we have 400,000 products online, 2,500 coming in each day. So these are just individuals uploading their products. Um, I think where, where, where we are, um, at the same time, you know, we are a marketplace, but at the same time, we are a fashion site and we really want to build our fashion brand. And uh, creating content and also content creation and curation are two very critical aspects of that. So what we are doing uh, currently, we do our own fashion shootings. We have a stylist, in-house stylist, who um, you know, creates shootings and um, you know, we define fashion themes and then we do shootings using products that are you know, actually uploaded by our clients who loan them to us and we really you know, put them in a you know, mise-en-scene or like in an ambience for them to, to really value, uh, to valorize the product and to really you know, give people a desire, a real, you know, to motivate them to, to purchase it. And, 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 and so it's, it's a different way of giving a new life to these, you know, secondhand uh, items. But I think um, that is, we also have a blog, um, but we're really currently uh, looking at new ways uh, to uh, develop the content on our site and um, to perhaps reinforce also um, the contribution of the community. So it's, it's definitely a, a key uh, issue for us and uh, something we, we really uh, plan to build uh, more over the next few months. So, yeah, I think there's a specific issue on the P2P marketplace is that uh, for us, our users, they are not clients. They are, in a way, not even users, they are partners. Because for a lot of them, it's, it's like a new, a new activity they, they, they never did before. So uh, they, and yeah, honestly, sometimes they are not always professional photographers and pictures are keys for sure. If you want to book a place, you want to know where you're going to stay at. Um, and this is why we, we decided very quickly to, to send them for free uh, a professional photographer, uh, which was a huge cha challenge, uh, still now actually, because we have uh, something like 3,000 photographers around the world. So yeah, that's a lot of work. Can I also say that stories, I think, are a really valuable social currency, and I think that that's really valuable content that should be shared across all I mean, marketplaces. There's always a story behind a person that's using what you're building, and sharing that with people is a really good way to get people connected. Okay, I, I don't know how many of you are startups or entrepreneurs. If you can raise your hand. Um, well, okay. Um, so here on, on this panel, you have very uh, successful companies, but I think Everything that has been shared here can be applied from the start of your company, and I can attest it myself with cooking, with very small, but doing your first offline meetup, trying to create content from the beginning, uh, whatever your size, whatever your, your money, I mean, it's just time and ideas, it's very, very valuable, so note everything they've just said, and, and you can apply it tomorrow or tonight. Um, okay, is this good transition or not um, to the other topic, uh, <laughs> building critical mass? Um, <laughs> this is even more complicated for you. Um, we we want to start with with the definition of of course. So what's the critical mass for a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace? Because if you go to investors, they will tell you, yeah, you need a critical mass, and then we'll talk. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'd say there are two definitions, obviously, especially in our case. Uh, okay, for first of all, it's what's it's the critical mass from the users point of view. So basically, we could have a sharing group with 100 people, and they're lending tools to each other, and, they're, and whenever they need some tool, then they get that. So they might have critical mass as, as such, and it's enough for them. Uh, if you want some figures, then maybe, I'd say, usually marketplaces operate on, so there's listings. So if you'd say that every, every second listing at least leads to a, one successful transaction, then you probably have critical mass. There might be different different estimates, uh, and it might differ in the marketplaces. But then obviously there's the business perspective also. So when you are a successful marketplace, most collaborative consumption companies operate on the model that if there's a monetary transaction, then they take a commission. So then, for instance, we calculated that uh, for every five users, we have one transaction per month on average, something, something like that. So then if an average, average transaction size would be let's say it would be 50 euros, then you take 10% commission, then you get five euros, then you can calculate from there, okay, how much money you wanna make to actually impress the investors and, and 
So, so that's, that's a whole different story. You, you probably need a lot of those. Mariel, um, question for you. <laughs> I think uh, for us, I, we never really thought in terms of critical mass. I mean, it was al we always wanted to be build something really big. And um, that's why we didn't, I think, contrary to some other, um, you know, uh, people operating in the same sector as us, we never, we really had a pretty large scope. So, um, like, for example, we do all of fashion. We don't do just luxury fashion, even though V-dressing has a more luxury, high-end image. Really, our motto is from Zara to Prada. So you'll see all the kinds of brands. We have more than probably 5,000 brands uh, online, even though we communicate more on 1,700, but... Each, each there, there's hundreds of brands being, I don't know, I mean, each week hundreds of brands or something like that being added. Um, uh, maybe not each week, but anyway, so, um, so I think from the beginning we really looked large and then we did things in a very non-traditional way. Um, we decided to take 10% commission where everyone was, you know, other people were taking much higher commissions. People, a lot of investors didn't understand our approach at the beginning and um, some of them may still not. <laughs> but I think uh, from the beginning we really just uh, looked in terms of, you know, how can we build, how can we build the product? How, what kind of product can we build so that people would like it and would want to use it and would maybe start using our platform instead of eBay? or Le Bon Coin, or maybe would start um, people who would never sell their clothes online because they never thought anything was um, adequate, they would start using our platform. And, they, and so I guess the idea for us is we always wanted to be something really big, but for us that really meant just developing a product and service that really appealed to people. Yeah, but for example, you want to, before you answer, Cameron, but before, you, you want to open new uh, locations, like yeah. new, new countries. So. Uh, at what point will you say, okay, we have enough supply so we can operate in a country? Well, just to give you a little, I mean, we, just to give you a little background on our history in France, um, what we did, uh, we, when we launched, we had a very basic site. Um, we we had did a really tiny round of seed funding and we basically just had enough money to develop the site and, um, you know, the first few months of expenses, very, you know, little, little financial means. But um, we did these uh, partnerships with fashion bloggers at the beginning. So we did these two rounds of teasing. And the first was like, uh, you know, a contest, win a luxury bag, um, sign up. And so the fashion bloggers talked about it. And around two weeks, we had, I don't know, 3,500 signups. And then, then we did another contest. Hey, put a product in line and, you know, um, get to maybe get a chance to win um, one of these other luxury products, you know, a second contest. And so after like two more weeks, we had around 5,000 products online. So before we launched, we actually had a catalog of 5,000 products. So I think once you, um, for us, I think one of the key indicators, and um, maybe it wasn't such the same for our direct competitors, was catalog size. And ultimately, I think uh, to be a category killer, uh, you really need, uh, the catalog is so fundamental, the, the size of your catalog, because that is really what is going to, uh, once you build that catalog, once you get more and more people on your site, once you get more and more offer, um, the demand kind of follows the, the, the offer. It's like the chicken and egg scenario, but at the, at, it, it's really the, the, the supply, at least on our side, that has been building the demand, and that has been making us kind of a site that's, that you can't miss for if, you, if, you, if you're into this sort of thing, so, yeah. Okay. Clément, you wanted to answer something or? No, no, I was just um, um, thinking about the fact that in a way, um, building your community uh, would never be the reason why you, you get your critical mass. Uh, I think product is the key. Product and yeah. service is the reason why you will get yeah. your critical mass. And meeting your community and getting feedback from, from, from it will be the, the, the best way to get this feedback that will help you to improve your service and, and, and your customer support and everything. And, and, and so it's just a, it's a indirect, direct way to, to, to get your critical mass. But I think that the product and the service, if you have a bad product and a, yeah. and a bad service, you, even if you have like tons of community managers, you would never get your critical mass. Okay. Exactly. Uh, the, the Airbnb example showed that you went on a, on a location by location approach, um, country by country, city by city. Um, do you have any numbers? I know the answer because we talked about it before, but just in case you guys have the same question, do you have any numbers where, for example, for a city, if you have 100 hosts, you say, okay, 
we have the critical mass for this specific location, so we'll do more things with, with this and we organize a meetup, for example, or? Yeah, so, so, um, it, so let's go back in, in 2009. Uh, so Airbnb has been launched in San Francisco and, and, um, and one day the, the founders, they, they, they were noticing that uh, they had much more users in New York rather than San Francisco, which was weird because you could have thought that you have more early adopters and they have their personal networks that could have helped. Actually, no, it was not San Francisco, it was New York. And, and I think there were like 100 or 150 hosts and they considered that it was uh, enough to, 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 to go there. So at the end, it will depend on you know, how, many, uh, how much money you want to spend in your, <laughs> spend in your uh, plane ticket and everything. But for them, it was, it was just a, a, a good reason to, to, to go there. And it has been the same in, in Paris after that. And it's, so the thing is that uh, on, on our site, and we talked about that, but yeah. that's the same for you, yeah. we, we don't decide to, to open uh, a city or a country. It's, it's open at the, at the, well, at the beginning. Well, your site is in English, so it's from the beginning it's in yes, international. Yes. And, and we decided to open those uh, 12 offices in uh, 2011, 12, uh, because it was, um, it was, this was, um, those markets was really strategic for us, like for instance, Paris, France, uh, London, and, uh, and, and so we, we just wanted to, to, uh, to have this, this, those offices to be more local. Um, we, we hired uh, people to translate the, the site in every language. So now I don't, I don't remember how many, it's like 30 languages or maybe more. Um, so it was more, okay, do we want to be in those markets for a lot of strategic reasons, the, the potential of the market and everything, and, and the existing community? But it's, it, that's a very important question to, to, to ask yourself, like, do I have to, to, to go to this city or what? And, and the way you will uh, build your products can be very important too if you if you can just keep the control of okay we are just in France and we are going to open uh, abroad or just in Paris and we are going to launch another city in like Marseille or whatever it will have a lot of consequences for your uh, development so that's a very good question to have at uh, at the really beginning so Gitsi has been acquired and yep. will the model will change or yep. a little bit. So, do you think finding critical mass was the main um, like uh, issue? For Gitsy? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. It's a, it's a, it's a thing for any marketplace, especially a small, uh, a smaller one. <laughs> sure. I mean, I can talk a, bit, a little bit about how we sort of approach growing in different places, and a lot of it for us was also like organic growth because we got some really nice press and also word of mouth. Um, but yeah, so how we started was we launched in Berlin because that's where the, the team was based and that's where we were still based and are still based. And then uh, the founders are from Amsterdam, so we launched in Amsterdam because the network there. And then we chose to launch in New York, San Francisco, uh, London, um, and Los Angeles. And these were very difficult things to do because we were super, super small and we were out doing like outreach to people and trying to build a community that didn't exist yet where we had every day people writing us saying, oh my gosh, it'd be so great to have Gidzi in this city or this city. And uh, after the Los Angeles launch, which was very, very tough, um, uh, we decided to flip it around. And this is a really important community building tool for us. And we called it uh, Unlock Your City. So people who were really excited about Gidzi in their own places, we were like, okay, so here's a challenge for you. If you really think that Gidzi's gonna work, um, you and three friends have to organize five different activities and put them on Gidzi and we'll give you your own city launch and it's gonna be great. We will go, we'll make a big press thing out of it and it's gonna be awesome. And this worked for nine different cities across the world. Uh, Istanbul, Hasselt and Ghent in Belgium, which was hilarious. It was like, a Springfield Shelbyville thing. It was so funny. And then uh, Paris, Barcelona, Cape Town, and uh, some other places. Um, and then after that, uh, we realized that we had uh, some stuff going on in cities all over the world, and we just decided to open it up to everybody. Um, but I mean, these, th this is a very small scale thing, like five activities in one city. So, so that's not really critical mass, but it was still a, a nice community building yeah. thing. 
Mary will said that um, you, you well she's focusing on, on supply like is that most well, important? I mean I, at first you need supply what especially at the beginning now we do focus on demand but more from especially an online marketing okay. yeah. approach um, okay. that's where we more focus on demand up until now we really haven't had to do any marketing at the beginning we did marketing for like we did a couple contests for the supply after that, it just came naturally. Now we're thinking of ways to maybe stimulate more in certain areas. Okay. Do, how, oh, do you want to? Yeah, we've also, also noticed that since we are typically dealing, especially like marketplaces that are just starting, I, I think that's the most crucial thing, really. Like you said, that you have to have the catalog already when you yeah. launch it in public. Yeah. You have to have stuff there. So if people come and there's an empty marketplace, it just doesn't work. You have to see that there's like an end, like an, it, what looks like an endless list that is yeah. just going on and on, and then yep. you're after a good start. Um, I have another question for you, for you, Katie. Is did you define what is your well, what was your typical like experience provider um, so that it, it it will help you to find them? Yeah. How, do, how did you find your 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 supply? Yeah. Th this was a, this is also a tricky thing. I mean. Not so much. Like, if you are a passionate person that has a skill that you could possibly share with somebody else, the idea was just to try to convince you to turn that onto like a teaching opportunity, essentially. And not a lot of people realize that if you really like making cheese, you could probably find someone else that likes to make cheese and then teach them how to do it. So that like the the typical experience provider for Gidzu is just a really passionate person that has something that they could possibly share with somebody else. And this ranges from yeah tours and tour operators to just individuals. So you didn't focus on any niches or vertical specific. It depended on the city, really. Like um, for sure, in like different places, maybe if they had a strong like uh, co-working space uh, community, um, then we could target the co-working space and try to get a partnership with them because they have events all the time. Or if there's a place like Cape Town, for example, which is a really big tourism hub, then that that would be the vertical that we sort of went after in in those cities. We we have two minutes left, and I think we'll take five minutes more. Uh, but I, I wanted yeah. I'm like that. Um, I, I wanted to open up to questions um, because, like, more than 50% of you are startups or entrepreneurs. So, um, yeah, I have one question. I have one mic. Hi there. Yeah, please I'm introduce you briefly before you ask your question. I'm Dario. I'm from Malta. I work for a startup company. Um, but I basically I have one question for Katie, please. Um, I missed the introduction. I'm not sure if you explained it. What was the reason for the takeover of Gitsi? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it was. It's more of a, a, a collaboration. So basically, uh, we were moving into the space that Get Your Guide is already operating, and rather than deciding to compete with them, we decided that it would be better to work together to uh, go after the same goal. Basically. Did you encounter any difficulties in growing or? Any difficulties in growing? In growing or it's mainly because of a, is it a good thing or is it a It's a really, really, really good thing. The whole team has moved over to the Get Your Guide team. Everyone there is super inspiring. We all are working to make it a really great platform. Yeah, it's a very positive. So you're still all part of the new yeah. team? Oh, yeah, I'm great. the community manager now at Get Your Guide. Good luck. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sebastian from Peer Trust. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about, uh, you talked a lot about growing the community and just a little bit about the chicken and egg problem, which is of course a, a very common problem for marketplaces because you need to have uh, supply to have demand and vice versa. Uh, could you share some of more of the strategies that you used, some of, some of them probably very creative to solve this issue of having a, a big, uh, community on both sides in a localized area? We hired a sales team. Uh, we poached a guy who was the second highest uh, salesman at Airbnb, and he joined Gidzi to help us grow our Good supply figure. side. <laughs> and that worked quite well. For us, it's been a lot of going through existing offline networks. So basically, we have started it from university campuses, or it has been started from an association that, that there are already thousands of people. So basically, first there's a small group of people who add at the base, and then you send some mass communication to lots of people. So that, that's usually how the, our most successful company, communities get started. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for your stories. Um, I'm Ietke Schouten from peerbuy.com. It's, a, it's a net, an online platform to uh, borrow stuff from your neighbors. It's from the Netherlands. Um, I have a question on your relation with sales and marketing in your companies because uh, I think word of mouth is the best way to spread the word. But um, I mean, for example, you just said, Katie, that sales is a very important thing. What is the relation between the two of this? Or also within marketing? I mean, can you do it only with word of mouth? I mean, I don't know. I think that depends on the scale. Um, for, we didn't do any real traditional marketing at Gidzy, um, and sales came in the, the very end of it all. Um, but I get your guide. They're, they have a, a quite aggressive marketing team, and they do really, really well. So I think that they, yeah, the sales and the marketing there balance each other out, and it helps with their growth. And can you say, for example, in percentages, how many, uh, uh, how important is sales now for Gidzy, and how important is the community to get more supply? Um, yeah, so community at Get Your Guide is actually a new thing, which I am starting by myself. I'm really excited about it. Um, and sales is basically, uh, I guess, 100% sales and marketing. And now get, uh, the, the community will come up and take some of that over. Well, and I think that for young startups, um, uh, community, it's, it's not like a, a separate uh, department. Uh, we, you, you can also uh, set up uh, operations like cross-departments operations. Uh, for instance, we, 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 did this, uh, we did one for uh, Marseille-Provence 2013, so the European capital of uh, art and culture. And uh, so we, we, uh, we invited our um, local artist community on the site in Marseille, and thanks to, to see how they wanted to be engaged with this, uh, this, uh, this event. And this is how we, we got this partnership with the, um, with the, the, the organizer. And, and we could have uh, like PR with it, and so sometimes you can you can you can mix marketing and, and community in uh, in in very relevant operations. For sure. Hi. Thanks for the uh, great um, conversation. I am an entrepreneur, and uh, I would like to um, announce something uh, more specific about uh, how you reach to the tipping point, because you know that you, you can clearly identify which is the early adopters, which is the early stages of the startup, and after you go to the mainstream. But um, in terms of a return of investment on marketing to reach to the tipping point, can you really plan how much money you should allocate to the marketing and selling efforts in the early stages so you can really reach to the critical mass? Because after you reach to the tipping point, this is like a catalysator, right? Like everything is going more smoothly and you have the word of mouth, but how much money you should allocate to get to the tipping point? I I think it really depends on the yeah. metrics. Each each business has its own metrics, so it really depends on your, you know, customer acquisition costs, the, your margins. You know how much you can, um, you know, spend on marketing while you know making the it, it be profitable, depending on your custom customer lifetime value. I mean, it, it really depends. I think it's so specific for each uh, business to each business. Um, I think for us, I mean, we only have 10% commission, so. Um, you know, it makes a lot more sense uh, for us to grow organically or through network, community, than it does to invest a lot in paid marketing. I mean, we are exploring those channels too, but I mean, there's definitely a lot of optimization to be done on that front instead in terms of customer acquisition costs. Uh, whereas, um, you know, we really continue uh, to focus heavily on press, on network, on buzz, on blogger outreach, and these are the things that are the most profitable to us. So really depends. I think each business has its own rules. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mircha and I work on Use Together, which is a startup, uh, a website for people to share items between them, like yours. So we should talk. Uh, I come from Eastern Europe, Romania, and we started there. And I think most of you are from Western Europe or from US. I'm kind of curious, how do you approach the communities in Eastern Europe? If you see differences in user behavior, are the people in Eastern Europe, from your point of view, open to the idea of collaborative consumption? Uh, at least, uh, I, I think there are not necessarily huge differences, though we have noticed that uh, people in some 
USA and some Western Europe countries are perhaps more, uh, some, somehow they feel more motivated and more into the idea of sharing. And, and we've had, for instance, we have this uh, volunteer who translated this to Russian and then started to create some communities in Russia, uh, uh, but then was some issues and apparently it was really difficult for people to get to trust trust others and trust was kind of like a bigger issue there. So at least in that sense, we kind of uh, are currently more may, perhaps focused on, on the Western markets at the moment. Hello, my name is Laurent Austin. I founded a website called uh, ContoirDuChic.com. Um, my question is, what's the difference between a community generated from selling to something to them or based on sharing among the com community, which is for me different? Is my question clear? Some businesses are based on sharing and some businesses are done with based on selling to them. So, so, so basically, basically the, the question was, is there a difference if people are making money through the platform or if they are just sharing for free? Right? For free or not, but what's the difference between the, those two types of community? Because the origin of the building of this community is different. The motivation is different. Well, if I may, um, for, for us, I think that we have a lot of hosts who, who, who start to, to, to use the site uh, because they, they want to make, make extra, extra money with it. But very, very quickly, uh, they realize that uh, they, can, they can experience much more and uh, on, a very, on a more human size, side. So um, I don't think that their motivation now is the, is the, is the money, but I think it may make, uh, uh, make a, a difference because when a host um, has money for his room or apartments, yeah, maybe he feels a little bit more engaged to, to his guests. Uh, so maybe that would be a little different on, on this front. But, um, but yeah, I the mean, money is not the, the, the main motivation for sure. I mean, I think there are some, I think it's also perhaps a bit of a division between open communities and closed communities, right? Like, so Facebook, you have a, a closed community, they're your friends. You share content with them, you share photos, you share pictures, you share moments of your life. So there's a certain liberty and um, certain ease with which you can interact with people with this community that you won't necessarily have the same um, on a commercial site when you're interacting with, a, you know, different random people you don't know. Um, there are some exceptions, you know, sites like couch surfing, but I think it requires a, test, a level of trust and openness that perhaps not everyone is uh, willing to engage in. So I think the advantage of um, platforms such as ours that we have, or, or uh, carpooling, or um, blah, blah, car, any Airbnb, dressing, it's we're acting as a third party guarantor. So obviously there's the community aspect, but we're also acting, you know, it's our platform that protects people and the sense of protection and security and um, you know that we're not just letting everyone. It's not like a Craigslist where just anyone can you know do what they want. And there's a chance that they may get taken advantage of. We we also uh, embody a role of responsibility, and uh, we have an obligation towards the members of our community. That's a Thank you. Bonjour, my name is Fleur. Um, I was just uh, thinking about, you, you spend so much time and energy to create and build up this community. How loyal is it at some point? Uh, do you have to deal with competitors? How do you have to nourish um, your community to make sure that uh, they, it will be loyal to your project and uh, won't move to another plat competitor platform? At some point. So yeah, loyalty is it's typically something really hard to to yeah. to, to measure, mm -hmm. and you have precise KPIs on it. Mm -hmm. But when you when you when you after a while, when you have uh, people among your community who ask for uh, who want to be more engaged, and when they want to organize their own meetups and these kind of things, I mean that's that's a good sign to see that they are really really engaged. And, and now we have more and more like service providers among the communities and, and there is this kind of kindness and, and generosity even between them. So 
but but stickiness between the community it's it's fun, it's crucial if you yeah. if you want to keep them and by creating connections between them rather than creating connections with you only it's it's really really important and maybe it's the best way to 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 not to to give them the idea to to use competitors i i think definitely um Customer loyalty is critical, and um, it's it's something that's on our, the top of our minds. Um, I think uh, when you're on a marketplace such as ours, you know, having the sellers come back, put their you know the maximum of products uh, they have on your website, um, so you're making them happy. They're coming back, and then the buyers know they can get the best products on your website. So that's that's one of the key uh, components. Um, but it's, it's, I think, I would say it's, your customers are only going to be as loyal, especially in the early stages when you're a startup, as loyal as you are good as a product, as a platform. So um, one of our, you know, the thing we focus the most on is improving our product and our platform on a constant basis and, and continually, you know, satisfying our customers and really taking into account their because we, we're fortunate to have a lot of customer feedback, p customers who write to us, you know, members who write to us saying they would like this or they don't like this. And, and, and I think the key is just, you know, the key to customer loyalty, I mean, it's, it's obvious, it's just customer satisfaction. And um, if you have a community, I think for me it's the, same, it's the same approach. You know, you really need to take into account their needs, to respect their needs, to respond to them, because tomorrow someone else could be doing something better than you, and they will flock to it if, they, if, you, don't, if you don't move. If you don't, uh, so you have to really constantly evolve, and that's that's the game we're in. That's the internet. So. Yep. Okay. Yep, I have. Yep. 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 Uh, I have to stop here. We could continue like that during one hour. Um, Mayol, Katie, Clement, and Juho, um, thank you very much for your time and your your answers. I'm sure as it's lunch time now, uh, you'll be available for other questions from people. So please come to them and ask them any question you might have. Uh, thank you very much, and Maeva, you have something to tell. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah.